Hi, this is Pastor Jonathan, and you are watching Ask the Pastor. This is an opportunity for you to ask questions of me about the Bible, God, religion in general, and I will do my best to try to answer those questions. And I'll be the first to tell you that there are going to be a lot of questions that I can't answer just simply because I uh, need to brush up on a certain area or need to learn more about it. But I will do my very best to try to answer any questions that you might have. And today our question is, are we living in or near the apocalypse? That's a great question. I think it feels pretty relevant right now because of what we're seeing going on in the world. Our stock market is struggling. We're seeing uh, problems with international trade. And of course, the, the uh, systemic cause of it all is a, a global crisis um, that is unrivaled for decades, if not longer than that. And so it's natural and it's normal for us to ask the question, are we living in the end time? And uh, I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you the short answer. And if you are satisfied with the short answer, then you can cut me off and go about your day. Um, if you want to continue to listen, I will proceed with the long answer. The short answer is that uh, I personally don't think that it's possible for us to know uh, to know that I don't think that scripture uh, I don't think that scripture functions in a way to give us definitive answers about that as much as some teachers and denominations might lead us to believe uh, and so I will unpack that a little bit more in the longer answer so the second part of the short answer is um, that I don't think that we are my own opinion is that I don't think that we're living near the end of time. Um, so I want to share with you, um, I'm getting ready to transition now into the long answer. Um, I want to share with you a, a passage from a book that I was reading last week, and it's about Jesus. Um, Bart Ehrman is a New Testament scholar who teaches at the University of North Carolina. And he's written a book um, taking a, a specific uh, view of who Jesus was as a millennium prophet, as a prophet who came to announce that God's judgment was coming upon the world and it was the end of time. And in this book, uh, in the introduction of this book, he talks about how that essentially every single generation since the first Christians, including the first Christians, believed that um, it was going to the end of the world was going to take place within their own lifetime and that Christ would return. And so in this book, he talks about the year 1988. And I'm going to go ahead and apologize beforehand because as I was reading through this, there are some events that took place in 1988 that I don't, that I'm not familiar with. I don't remember. I turned four at the end of 1988. And so I don't know some of the, the contents uh, of of um, what he's talking about. So please bear with me. He says, future historians looking back on the 20th century will not consider 1988 an exceptionally significant year. It was a time of large scale natural disasters, a hurricane that left half a million Jamaicans homeless and an earthquake in Armenia that savaged entire cities and left 40,000 dead. Somewhat less earth-shattering was the national news here in the States. In 1988, the federal government bailed out the country's savings and loans institution, and George Bush trounced an ill-fated presidential bid by Michael Dukakis. More significant politically were the developments on the international scene. In particular, an uncommon number of international peace initiatives, the end of a six-year war in Nicaragua, the Soviet withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, the Atoyla Khomeini's proclamation ending Iran's war with Iraq, the first meeting between representatives of the United States and the PLO. From a historical perspective, these developments pale in comparison with the cataclysms of the year to follow, 1989, the year of 
uh, Tiananmen Square, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the first free election in the Soviet Union, the execution of the communist dictator of Romania, Nicolae Sesecu, the victory of Lech Walesa's Solidarity Party in Poland. By way of contrast, the most intriguing events on the American scene in 1988 were human interest stories that made life uh, made little long-term impact on the history of the world. This was the year that Leona Hemsley was indicted for income tax in invasion, that Sonny Bono was elected mayor of Palm Springs, that the Chicago Cubs played their first game in Wrigley Field under lights, and that evangelist Jimmy Swaggart staged a tearful confession before millions for taking a prostitute by the hand for purposes other than evangelism. But it was not supposed to be that way. 1988 was supposed to be the year of the century. In fact, the year of all time. 1988 was to be the year the world ended. So what Bart Ehrman is trying to convey is that Christians from every generation have believed and have probably have good um, reason to believe that the world might end within their lifetime or within um, very close proximity to the events that were taking place. So as I unpack uh, this long answer, uh, this longer explanation, um, I'm going to begin with the fact that I, I, I uh, think that Jesus um, believed that the world was going to uh, come to an end soon. And I, I see that personally whenever I read Mark chapter 13, that Jesus believed that uh, God's kingdom was going to come to, to earth um, by the end of the first century and that um, the Roman government would be brought down uh, by God's judgment and God's kingdom would um, rule and reign forever. And that might be problematic for some of us, depending on um, the way that we understand Jesus' ability to know and understand the future. For me, that's that's not a problem at all. Jesus was a prophet, and he made um, the claim that he did not know, along with the angels, he did not know uh, when this time would take place. But it, it appears that Jesus thought it was going to be soon. Likewise, the earliest Christians thought it was going to be soon. As I mentioned in, in our segment yesterday, all throughout Paul's letters, we see these little hints of Paul trying to help Christians move um, through this process because they weren't expecting their friends and family to die. And so as a pastoral leader, Paul is trying to provide them with some explanations and some answers about what is happening with their friends and their family members. And then, of course, we have uh, the book of Revelation, which we were doing a study on uh, right before all of this began to take place. And my interpretation of Revelation is similar to uh, the way that I understand Jesus' teaching. Uh, I, I think that John, who is writing Revelation, believes that, um, that the world is going to come to an end within the, the end of the first century or very shortly after that. He believes that it's going to um, be marked by the destruction of the Roman Empire. And so by virtue of saying that, I don't think that the book of Revelation is a book that projects um, future events in the, in the really distant future. I think that the author of Revelation, for the most part, is talking about stuff that he expects to happen very soon. And Jesus and John, the author of Revelation, and, and other writers of the New Testament use apocalyptic language and imagery, which is often difficult for us to understand. That's why uh, reading Revelation is so challenging. Is There's really so much there for us to decipher. Um, but apocalyptic language was intended to um, draw people in and to cause them to think more deeply about a subject and to consider it uh, in a more um, abstract kind of way. And so I don't think that the New Testament gives us this definitive timeline of how things are going to unfold in the future. 
And for some of us, that might be kind of uh, that might be kind of troubling because we want to know. We want to know when all of this stuff is going to happen. And, and from my perspective, and I certainly could be wrong, and, and I'm sure that what I'm sharing with you, it doesn't sound familiar because this isn't what we hear and read in, in popular movies and books uh, that I think are a bit sensational. Um, my view is is not the most popular view, but it's it tends to um, fall along with what most biblical scholars tend to think. Um, so with that being said, with that being said, let me read a passage of scripture that I hope will be comforting and helpful. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You might be familiar with this passage as the love chapter. And Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and I give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror. When we, Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, you might be wondering why I'm reading this passage. Um, Chapter 13, of course, uh, fits between chapters 12 and 14 uh, that both address spiritual gifts. And if we read all of 1 Corinthians, it appears that there are some uh, in the Corinthian church who are boasting, they are proud, they think that they are better than others because they have the superior gifts. They have the gifts that are revelatory, gifts that give them special information that others don't have. And so this would include the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues and the gift of knowledge. And what Paul is trying to do here, in my opinion, is he's trying to take the Corinthians down a peg. He's trying to bring them down a notch um, because they, uh, some of some of them, um, believe that they're better than others. And he's trying to put spiritual gifts into perspectives, into perspective that everyone has a different spiritual gift, and that it doesn't really matter what gift we have if our gift is, if the way that we use our gift is not motivated by love. Uh, And so if you listen closely to Paul's uh, words in chapter 13, um, it's really a passage about spiritual gifts. He talks about prophecy and tongues and knowledge, the gift and the ability to understand all of these things. And what's important for us to really take in is the end of chapter 13, Whenever he says that um, knowledge will pass away and that we that we can only prophesy in part. Um, and he goes on to say, but when the completeness comes, uh, what is in part will disappear. And then he uses this phrase, this expression um, about um, when I was a child, um, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. 
when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. So let me let me try to unpack all of this really quickly. When I was um, a kid, across the street from my house, there was this really steep hill. It was paved. It was a residential uh, driveway. It was a, it was a street, and it was really steep. It was a great place to sled when I was a kid. But in the summertime, I would take my radio flyer wagon and I would pull it up to the top of that hill and I would try to uh, to ride down and use that little handlebar to, to steer my way. And, and I would always wear a helmet, um, but I would typically crash when I got to the bottom. And then I got a little bit older. Whenever I was maybe about 12, uh, I got into something called street lugeing, uh, which you may have seen um in the Winter Olympics, there's also winter lugeing, which is uh, where you lay down on on something and you steer with the, the movement of your body. And basically, a luge board was um, this big long plank with um, skateboard uh, wheels that were attached to it. And I would lay down on it and go down this steep hill, and I would steer uh, by kind of moving my body to um, the left and to the right, just like you would with a skateboard. And and that was fun. That was, uh, for me, by the time that I was 12, that was a lot more fun than using the radio flyer wagon. Um, but once I turned 15, uh, that really wasn't all that fun. It wasn't cool anymore. The cool thing for me to do was to get my learner's permit and, of course, at 16 to get my driver's license. And by the time that I got my driver's license, I had absolutely no interest in getting my radio flyer, flyer wagon or riding a luge board because I could drive. I could get on the interstate and I could go 70 miles an hour. And for me, that was pretty awesome. And that's the illustration that Paul is giving us here to, to kind of understand his teaching. And he's talking about spiritual gifts. That each and every one of us have spiritual gifts that we're able to use to build up and encourage and edify the body of Christ while we're living here on earth. But he says when the complete comes, and my understanding of that is he's talking about when Christ returns. When Christ returns, we'll no longer need these revelatory gifts because the, the full manifestation of Christ will be before us. We won't need the gift of prophecy. We won't need the gift of tongues. We won't need the gift of knowledge because Jesus Christ will be in our midst in front of us. And so these gifts that the Corinthians think are better than others and they're touting around as better than others, um, these are just temporary ways for the church to understand who God is for this present time. And so Paul is really not just talking about spiritual gifts, he's talking about the future and our ability to know and our ability to understand what is going to happen next. Um, and there's a, there's a phrase in here that is so incredibly important for us to understand. He says in verse 12, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And so Paul is saying that our knowledge is partial, that right now what we see and understand is partial compared to in the future, we will um, be able to see and understand Christ in the same way that Christ sees and understands us. And that's a pretty big promise that he makes, but he uses this expression that it's like looking in um, looking in a, a reflection of, uh, of a mirror. Uh, I studied this passage of scripture in depth one time, and I realized that after reading multiple translations that this verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, is translated in a variety of different ways. And for me, that is always an indicator that biblical committees who are, who are developing translations of the Bible struggle with how to express something. Whenever whenever you see translations that are very different, it means that these translation committees, they really 
had a hard time trying to put it into words. And so I began studying this verse in, in more depth. And um, as I opened up my Greek New Testament, I, I came to realize that the Greek word that Paul uses in this passage is the word enigma. And it's where we get our English word, wait for it, enigma, that we're looking into an enigma. Some translations say that we're looking into a foggy mirror. Some say that we're looking into a glass darkly. Uh, Paul is saying that we are looking into an enigma. When we're trying to see and understand the future, it isn't clear. Um, it is kind of like when we um, run the, the hot water in the bathroom and then try to look into the mirror. We might be able to see some shapes and some colors, but for the most part, we're not going to be able to really discern and see a clear depiction of, of what is being cast into that mirror. And right now, that's where we stand in terms of trying to understand what's going to happen next. The mirror is foggy. It is not clear. For some of us, that isn't going to give us a great sense of hope and uh, comfort. But I think if we step back for a moment and look at what Paul's overarching message is, uh, it is a love that um, it doesn't really matter how much we're able to understand or even how much or, or what kind of gifts that we have to be able to understand the future. What matters the most is that we use the gifts that we have right now with uh with a great sense of love. That's really the bottom line. When we read Jesus's teachings on what is going to happen next at the end of time, um, I personally believe that we're not gonna be able to walk away with a definitive timeline of the future, but we do walk away with a certain sense of ethics, that we are to love God and to love our neighbor, that we're supposed to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And that we should live in such a way that we are always ready for Christ's return, whenever that happens and however that might happen. So I hope that this helps um, explain um, my understanding of whether we're living in or near the apocalypse. Personally, I believe that the future is open. I don't think that there's a clear timeline of how things are going to unfold. Um, but when we look at the Apostles' Creed, it gives us some simple, concrete things to think about, that Christ will return, that Christ will judge, that there will be a resurrection. Um, those are some concrete events that the Christian faith has historically embraced. And um, those are kind of the, the pieces of furniture that I leave in, in my mental living room of, of what I think the future holds. And even with that being said, um, I still uh, keep in mind that those events could happen in ways uh, that are very different than I can even begin to imagine. Know this, know that you are loved and that whatever the future holds, it is good. Because as John Wesley said on his deathbed, the best of all is that God is with us. I hope to get some more questions from you soon. I hope that you are blessed. Until next time, take care. God bless you.